Hi, Charles. How are you tonight? I'm all right. How are you? That's great. That is excellent. Well, uh, good evening, y'all. Uh, good to see you tonight. Thanks for being here. Hope you've had a good day. Uh, we'll get into our Bible class here in just a minute. And uh, I know also, exciting tonight, that uh, Tanisha, I know, is... Uh, and maybe O'Brien with her back teaching uh, teach kids for uh, they'll be doing that over the summer. That's exciting that that'll be going on. Uh, Devade is here too doing that. Excellent, excellent. Uh, the, it's exciting to know that'll be going on while we're in here throughout the summer. Um, but let's begin with a word of prayer. And uh, what prayer requests or prayers of praise and thanksgiving do we have for tonight, Barbara? That's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, we'll give thanks for that and pray that it continues. Sue. Okay. Okay. Is it like a really high fever, like really dangerously high? Yeah, I think it's actually like a hundred and ten. Yeah, so high, enough to feel miserable, but yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll pray for him. It's in the morning. Okay. We'll certainly pray for that as well. Um, Bob contacted me today, asked that we be praying for him. Uh, he and Mary are on their way back. I believe they're splitting the trip up between today and tomorrow, and he asked that we pray for safe travels for them. So they uh, intend to be here this coming Sunday. Any others? Who? I'm sorry? Oh, that's right. Any update on his dad? Not much to update, yeah. And that's her brother-in-law, you said? Okay. Wow. Yeah, Washington State. Yeah, wow. Uh, Doris. Ron? All right. Well, if there's nothing else, then uh, bow with me and let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this evening. Thank you for this time that we can gather together and uh, see one another, and we pray that you bless this time of uh, time in your word and discussion and pray that we are built up uh, by this hour. We thank you for bringing us through this week so far. And we know that each one of us have encountered different things throughout the week. Some of us may have encountered different challenges or difficulties, but we also know that all around us, um, our lives are just abounding with blessings from you. And we're so thankful for those things. 
Father, right now we want to lift up those we mentioned tonight who need you in different ways, some among our number and some family members and friends. Uh, we want to pray for Barbara Hopper. We're so thankful for the great progress she's been making. Uh, we want to pray for her physical therapy as that begins and that you will uh, continue to bless her progress. We want to pray for the little boy Jackson. We're so thankful that he's been out of the hospital and and uh, overall has been uh, trending in the right direction, but he's been feeling pretty bad since Sunday with a high fever. Uh, we ask that they can get to the bottom of that and that you'll continue to bless him and that uh, he'll be able to come through this just fine. Father, we want to pray for our sister Sue, that you bless her tomorrow with uh, the PET scan and that you'll, you'll bless this process uh, and the results and, and the path moving forward. We pray that you'll bless Sue and Daryl with a a uh, real sense of your peace and presence and, and that you will guide them and bless them at this time. We also want to pray for Bob and Mary and that you'll bless them as they travel back. They've been uh, away from us for a couple of weeks now and we pray that this has been a wonderful and blessed trip for them, but we're also eager to have them back with us and uh, pray that you'll keep them safe. I want to pray for Guy Rosenbaum, whose father had a stroke and has maybe showed some slight signs of uh, moving forward, but but not too terribly much. We want to pray that you bless that whole family and bless his father. We also want to pray for Daisy's co-worker, Jill, and uh, you, that you'll bless her and her family as her brother-in-law is in uh, really, uh, really just difficult shape right now and has been taking a turn for the worst, and, and she's all the way over here while he's in Washington, and please bless that family, bless her brother-in-law, and uh, walk with them through this difficult time. I want to pray for uh, Doris's daughter-in-law, Lori. We want to thank you for the successful surgery that she had. I uh, want to pray that you continue to bless her in this fight with cancer and give her strength day by day and peace and, and help her physically, emotionally, and of course with the, the cancer itself, which we, we pray the surgery got it all, and, and we just want to continue to lift her up. And Lord, we want to pray for our brother Ron, who's uh, having some difficulties breathing and is having some uh, problems with the foot as well, and uh, Ramona has some health issues, and we want to lift them both up. So grateful that he's able to be here tonight. We're thankful for the great encouragement he is to everyone here, and we pray your blessings on him. Father, again, bless our time together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, tonight we come to our final class that is taking a closer look at the chosen. This has been... Uh, a little mini-series, uh, partially to kind of hold us over until the summer series. It's hard to do a, a five-week series on a whole book of the Bible or a whole theme in depth. Uh, but I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Thanks for being a part of this mini-series that we've been doing. Um, and so our final class tonight, we will be taking a look at the final moment of uh, this last season of The Chosen. And that final moment is Jesus walking on the water while the disciples are in the midst of a storm and Peter comes out to him and, and starts to drown. This is a very well-known moment from the Gospels. And <clears throat> personally, I thought that the way this was depicted in The Chosen was very well done. And the first time I saw this season with Kelsey as it was coming out, I thought that one scene alone makes like the whole season worth it. I, I just thought it was really well done, really powerful. Um, so we'll be looking at this moment tonight. Now, in some of our classes, we, we've gone about these, these um, we've gone about this series different ways each week. And in some of them, what we've done is we've looked at the parallel accounts found in the Gospels uh, and, and examined each one of them, noted similarities and differences and things. This time around, we're only really going to focus on one particular account of this moment, and that's the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this is also found in Matthew and John. And we will take some time to read Matthew's account because actually Matthew was the only one that has Peter walking on the water, which is a major addition. And so we, we will read Matthew's account, but most of our time we'll actually spend in the Gospel of Mark. We're only going to be focusing on one account tonight out of the three because there is so much to explore from the rest of Scripture, I was especially thinking there's so much to explore from the Old Testament that throws light on the significance of this moment from the life of Jesus. And The Chosen actually shows its awareness of this, which is something that I appreciate about this show, is they, they, they're they willing and, and eager to dive deep to make some connections that we may not make on our own when we're reading the scriptures. Uh, but The Chosen is aware of this, and actually, if you remember, this whole episode is framed at the beginning and end by 
the reading slash singing of a psalm. And that psalm is, is one moment that connects to Jesus walking on the water. And we'll look at some other Old Testament scriptures as well uh, that will help us, I think, see some real depth to what's happening here that can help us appreciate uh, this moment even more. So let's first read Matthew and Mark's account, and then we'll watch the Chosen's depiction of this, and then we'll discuss some, and we'll do a little bit of exploring. So here on the screen is Matthew's account, which is a little lengthy, again, because it has the, uh, it includes Peter walking on the water. So this is Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Um, Barbara, would you be willing to read this for us? Thank you. It's on two slides. Thank you. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves. For the wind was against them, and in the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. All right, thank you. And now let's move on to Mark's account, which is briefer, Mark 6, 45 through 52. Um, Doris, would you be willing? Thank you. If you could read this for us, please. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him, and they were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. All right, thank you. And then the, the, account, the account in John, which we won't look at tonight, but if you just want to look at it on your own time, it's in John chapter 6. Uh, if you want to find it there on your own time, John chapter 6 is where we read. John's account of this. So just one thing to mention before we watch The Chosen that Mark and Matthew both do. Mark makes it a little more explicit here, uh, like within this particular passage. But both of them have this scene coming right after Jesus feeding the 5,000. And in Mark, there's actually an explicit connection within our passage. Uh, they were astounded at what happened, and Mark says, for they did not understand about the loaves. So these two passages are meant to be read together. They can kind of help interpret one another. And the chosen, I think, picked up on that, and that's why they had that moment come right after feeding uh, the 5,000. So maybe just keep that in mind. But apart from that, I would like us to just go ahead and watch the scene, and then we'll get into some discussion. It's about, I think, about 10 minutes long. Thank <laughs> you. 
too strong. We should turn back. We can get there. Just keep rowing. Simon, it's the fourth watch of the night and we've been stuck in the same place for hours.
in our grief and advise us of the wounds of the broken hearted. I'm here. I'm always here. I let people go hungry. But I feed them. Please. Please don't let me go. Okay, uh, my apologies for not having the subtitles on. I forgot to turn them on. Hopefully you could still catch uh, what was being said and at least, at least catch most of it. Uh, before we launch into anything else, let me just take a moment to ask any questions or thoughts on reflections on what we read and what we saw and maybe similarities, differences, or things that struck you a different way, seeing it perhaps and reading it. Any, any thoughts of that nature you'd like to share before we, uh, before we move forward? One thing that was interesting to me is Jesus' rebuke, I guess you could say. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
to see it, on, to, to hear it, uh, it was a much gentler rebuke than we may have thought from just reading it. Um, and, and perhaps that's a good reminder that we can struggle to read tone into texts. And maybe we all know this if you've ever been texting back and forth with someone and gotten a little offended over something that was actually supposed to mean nothing because over text messages you can't read tone. Um, but even if there was a stronger word of rebuke coming from Jesus, I don't think that necessarily would have meant he was being unloving if, if he did give a stronger word of rebuke than, than, than what they depicted. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, O'Brien, let me see. Uh, Doris, if you can get the microphone back to you. Uh, I was going to say I thought that in that moment there were, I guess, two different um, I guess two different areas where the belief was in, I guess, in question. So I feel like the rest of the of the disciples, you know, it was still kind of like, you know, when they when he was like, "Hey, it's me, it's Jesus." Have you still not, you know, pretty much like everything I've been doing, you, st you still don't know? Yeah. And it was just more of theirs, like still not knowing and believing and having the faith that he he was who he said he was, mm -hmm. uh, the chosen one, and I felt like. Um, the other one was just the faith that we like that we that we have a lot of times where when something something goes bad, just having that faith that it's for a good reason and things will work out to where um, felt like that scene kind of showed kind of the two different I guess points of view of faith where one was just believe actual believing in Jesus and that's who he was and and his power and then the other one is just I think one. One that more often get, gets tested with us is just the faith that he has his hand on everything and things will work out. And just because uh, bad things are happening doesn't mean that um, things will work out in the end. So. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. That's really important, those two kinds of faith, because sometimes we can focus on one that we can forget the importance of the other sometimes. And we may sometimes struggle with faith more than we realize because we fully believe the Bible and we and in God and in Jesus as his son. But sometimes do we really believe that he can do what he say he will do? Do we really believe he will be with us the way he says he is? So, yeah, that's a, that's a great observation. Two different kinds of unbelief happening in that same scene. Anything else? Barbara, uh, if you could pass the microphone back up, O'Brien, thank you. So I, I had never um, really realized that he had compared this with their um, recent feeding the thousand, the five thousand. So I got to thinking about how that um, correlated the two of them, mm -hmm. uh, two events, and then realized, well, he's showing us that he has power over matter. Mm. Um, he can control the sea. He can create bread and fish. Mm. He can duplicate, you know, he can turn water to wine. Yeah. Um, and so he can do anything that even seems impossible. Mm. And uh, we're not to question when he doesn't do the things that we think that he should do. Like, like uh, Peter was, he didn't understand here he is, a follower. He's given up his whole life mm -hmm. to um, follow Jesus, and yet he was mad at him because his wife miscarried. Yeah. And so, you know, in the end, he's apologizing because he realizes, you know, Jesus is explaining it to him that, you know, he has yeah. reasons, and he needs him to be able to get through the hard things, yeah. you know, so that he can use him for things in the future. I, I, so I'm seeing how he means to strengthen us through our trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. you know, that he's got other work for us. You know, until the you know, day we die, there's work for us to do. That's right. And uh, the, the two different types of belief, yeah, we, that belief that is put into action sometimes means 
not serving others or going to church or passing out pamphlets or whatever, but working on our inner strength to get through those tribulations yeah. is a strong proof of our, the strength of our faith. Yeah. Amen. And that point that he kept saying, just look at me. Yeah. Don't look at all the turmoil around you, the waves or the, you know, all the devastation. Just keep your eye on him. Focus on him. And we do that today through his word. Mm -hmm. We focus on him and his word, what he's taught us. And in prayer, we hang on to that. Yeah, absolutely. Great thoughts. Uh, I, I don't want to move on too quickly. So is, is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, um, building on a little bit of what you said there at the end, Barbara, uh, one final observation I'd like to make before moving into some Old Testament things. It's not really a, a particularly uh, original observation, but this, this story is part of this portrayal of this moment is part of a larger storyline in The Chosen that you remember if you've been here where, like you were saying, Peter and his wife had miscarried, and that's why Eden is going into this ritual purification bath at the same time that Peter is walking on the water. Uh, so the way, they've, the way they have set this story within a larger story that they have created is the storm is, is really just symbolic of a different kind of storm that Peter is going through. Not just symbolic, that, that's over, but it is. It is symbolic of a different kind of storm. Uh, and so Peter is meeting Jesus in the midst of his own personal trial as he's meeting Jesus in the midst of a raging sea. And that is the way that we tend to interpret this scene. I remember, I, I said this when we first watched it. Most every time I've ever heard this passage preached or taught, it is about keeping your eyes on Jesus in the storms of life. And that is such a, powerful, beautiful application of this passage, and, and they, they went that same direction uh, in the way they chose to portray it here as well. So a few things I'd like us to, to think about in the time we have left. We may not get through everything. I might skip around a little bit if that's okay, but Jesus walking on water. So we all know that this is an amazing miracle. We, we have probably read it or heard it taught or preached many times uh, over the years, uh, of course, no one can just take a stroll across the sea. So this is an amazing moment, just like Jesus feeding the 5,000. But also, Jesus walking on the water communicates something about him that a broader appreciation of the rest of Scripture can help us see. Uh, the Old Testament actually has a lot to say about the sea and a lot to say about God's command of the sea. And what the rest of Scripture has to say, I think, can add some depth to this passage for us. So a couple of remarks on, on the sea, first of all. Many ancient people were terrified of the sea. Uh, the sea was, of course, it's big. It has depths that they, they can't fathom. They've never been to the bottom of it and lived to talk about it. Uh, and it's chaotic. It's unpredictable. I mean, we can be scared of the water for the same reasons today. And they were very often quite terrified of the sea. And also ancient people asked a lot of questions about the sea. Uh, they wondered why it has the boundaries that it does and what keeps it from just swallowing up all the land, you know, and uh, things like that. And those are, are, are good questions and they would answer those questions in a pre-scientific time. Uh, ancient people in general, I'm not talking about Israelites, but ancient people in general would answer that by saying, well, it's, it's the gods. The gods are, are keeping the, the waters in check where they are and have determined that this is their stopping point and this is the land starting point. Uh, and so when like floods happen or something like that, they need an explanation. It's typically something like, well, the gods must be really angry with us. And so they sent, they, they uh, you know, took away the barrier and the, the floods came and when they were satisfied, uh, you know, they set the barrier back up, things like that. So this type of thinking, uh, this, this terror of the sea and the way ancient people in general thought about it comes out quite a bit in the Old Testament. The sea is uh, often a, a metaphor that is used for a place of despair, of confusion, a place of death. So this comes out quite a bit. And the Old Testament consistently speaks of God as the one who has control over the seas. And this goes all the way back 
to creation. So uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness is over the face of the deep. All right, there's, this, there's the sea or the waters, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. So there's chaotic waters there as everything's without form and void, but then God shows his power over the sea. He uh, divides the waters. Um, he divides them up. And so uh, that is, again, God at the very beginning showing his command over the seas. A couple other passages I'd like us to read. This is Job 38, 8 through 11. It says, Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? Uh, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling, its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far you shall come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Again, this is the way people thought about sea. Uh, and this is part of God speaking to Job, uh, asking him a lot of questions that Job is, is incapable of answering. Another one, Psalm 89, verses 8 and 9. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. And then one other from Exodus. This is part of Moses reflecting on Israel crossing the Red Sea. So he's speaking poetically about what happened there at the Red Sea. Uh, and praising God. And he says, At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. There's the Red Sea parting. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, this is Pharaoh, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My, de my desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretch out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. So, you know, the waters come back and devour uh, the Egyptians. So we see lots of examples, and, and these are just a few, of God being the one who has control of the winds and the waves uh, the terrifying, chaotic sea is ultimately completely under God's command, and that really shows God's awesome, immense power. There are also a couple of Old Testament passages that speak specifically of God walking on or walking through the sea. It uses that kind of language. So a couple of those we'll look at. This is Job 9, verses 4 through 12. It says, uh, this is Job speaking about God. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? He who removes mountains and they know it not when he overturns them in his anger. Who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. Who commands the sun and it does not rise. Who seals up the stars. Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. There's our sea reference. And then it keeps on going. Uh, who made the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the chambers of the south. Who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number? Behold, he passes by me and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. Behold, he snatches away. Who can turn him back? Who will say to him, what are you doing? Uh, so this is Job talking about how God is just above him in every way, including his ability to trample the waves of the sea. And then one last one. Uh, this is from Psalm 77, which is actually the psalm that the Chosen used at the beginning and end of this episode, um, and I thought that was very well chosen. So this is just the very end of it. Uh, this is also, well, it's a mix of talking about generically God's provision, but it throws in a reference to the Exodus as well. So, when the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows, I, th I think that would be lightning. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea. Your path through the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. And then here's the Exodus reference. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Okay, 
So we've read lots of passages sh showing God's complete command over the terrifying, unpredictable, chaotic sea. Um, so only God in the Old Testament pretty, I mean, unanimously declares for us, only God controls the winds and the waves. And then we come to the Gospels and Jesus is commanding the winds and the waves. And Jesus is walking on the waters. And so if only God can do this, and then suddenly Jesus does it, well then who is Jesus, right? G Jesus is God would be, that seems to be the conclusion that the Gospels are, are pointing us towards. With that in mind, I want us to go back to Mark for a moment. In the midst of Mark's account, <clears throat> in verse 50, Jesus identifies himself. You know, they think they're seeing a ghost. And Jesus says, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Um, yeah, take heart, it is I. A literal translation of Jesus' identification of himself, if we wanted to translate it really woodenly from Greek into English, he'd be saying, take heart, I am. That's actually what he says. And does the phrase I am have some significance in the Bible? Yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Said, uh, can I say who you are? And he said, Tell us who you are. That's right. Moses at the burning bush, he asks who he should tell the Israelites sent him, and God identifies himself as, I am who I am. Now, it is true, just in the, the, that same Greek phrase is used frequently in the New Testament. In some contexts, it, it is just a way of identifying yourself. It is just a way of saying, it's me, you know. But in the context of someone walking on the water, it could easily also mean, I am the I am. In this context, it could easily mean more than Jesus simply saying who he is. He could be saying, well, he is saying who he is, but saying it in a greater sense than anyone else would normally use that phrase. Notice also in Mark, we read that Jesus was walking on the waters, and it says he meant to pass them by. That's kind of a, an odd detail. It's like Jesus was going to keep on walking, and then it's almost like if they didn't see them, he was just going to keep right on walking. Not, not sure where he'd be going, but he was just going to keep on walking. How does the walking know that Jesus intercedes Jesus about this incident right after? I, that's a great question. Maybe they were laughing and joking about it when he got to shore, you know? And yeah. Jesus said, hey, I want to go past you. So. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's an odd detail. It is. It, it is. is. But maybe, I, well, something I just... Yeah, yeah, maybe we'll just meet you there. Um, the Drew County has a sense of humor. I think he was yeah. going to get there and meet them there and yeah. go, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and also... On the, in Luke 24, on the Emmaus Road, uh, Jesus is walking with those two disciples, and I don't know who he is. He was going to just keep on going, and they asked him to come in and lodge with him. So he's, he's willing to do this kind of thing. So this is kind of an odd detail that we may not even think much about if we're just reading it straight through. But I want to just throw out a possibility to us based on one of the passages that we already read uh, from Job. Mark might be, with this detail alluding to Job uh, chapter 9, where it mentions God trampling the ways of the sea, uh, and then, it, and it's mentioning all these amazing things God does, and then he, he says, behold, he passes by me, and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. That is, that is basically Job's way of saying God does so much that I don't even notice. I don't even I don't even understand how he does it. I don't even know he's doing it. He's just incomprehensible. He is infinitely beyond me. Um, and so it's possible if God passing by Job is a way for him to express how incomprehensible God is. Uh, and then Mark writes that Jesus intends to pass by the disciples while he's walking on water, while saying, I am. It's possible that this detail is there to add to this conclusion that we're meant to reach, that it seems that Jesus is God. It's possible.
possible that that's why Mark threw that uh, detail uh, in there for us. Any questions or reflections on these Old Testament passages and how they might help us here? Uh, Barbara. I was just thinking of the incident where he was asleep in the boat and the sea got rough. Yeah. And they called and woke him up. And he, and he was the men, too, and he yeah. was asleep. And they called down. Was this before or after this event? Good question. And I don't remember. Yeah, that's a good question. I want to say, yeah, in Mark, at least, uh, him calming the storm that way comes before uh, this. It comes in Mark chapter 4. Yeah. Good question. Very poor memories. <laughs> yeah, and it is true that the disciples, especially in Mark, but, but it's true in all of them, they're portrayed as pretty thick-headed. I mean, they're pretty slow to grasp stuff. So, And even with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus will later turn around and feed 4,000. And then later in Mark, they're, they panic when they're trying to go somewhere and they realize they don't have any bread. And Jesus tells them, like, what happened when I fed 5,000 people? And what happened when I fed 4,000 people? You know, so, so, yeah, they're slow to grasp stuff. Great observation there. Any other thoughts uh, related to what we've been looking at related to the Old Testament and, and Mark chapter 6? Yeah, Doris. Yeah, if you didn't hear Barbara, she was saying there's this connection in both these passages of fear and lack of faith. And that's so true. Fear is, in many ways, kind of the antithesis. Uh, it was presented as the antithesis of faith. And in 1 John, it talks about how there's, there's no fear in love. And the one who does fear, that, John doesn't say if you have any fear, therefore you don't love God. He says... One who does fear has not yet been perfected in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And so there's a journey of growing in faith and love that will lead us to a continual separation from fear. But that's a difficult journey. And it's clearly a difficult one for the apostles because they're seeing all these amazing things and they're still wrestling with this stuff. But, yeah, great observation. Also, Doris, you mentioned Mark 4 just a moment ago. The way it ends... Mark 4, 41, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They're asking this question, yeah, they're asking this question, and as readers of Mark, we're meant to ask the question, and if we know things about, you know, God only controlling the sea and things, we can kind of get to the answer, right? We're meant, Mark, I think, is meant to, He's meaning us to answer the question that they're asking. And maybe we can have some sympathy for them because today thinking about God as Father, Son, and Spirit is just standard. And we may have been raised since childhood to believe that. This is a new thing for Israelites and Jews. The idea of God taking on human form is this is all so brand new. And how can God be right here while Jesus also prays to God and all of these kinds of things? And so they are really being thrown for a loop. And they are trying to put the pieces together. And it's a puzzle that, that we know now we're so used to. But for them, it's like a brand new puzzle. And they're just not sure how all these pieces are going to fit together. 
Well, um, I hope this has been a blessing to you. This, I think, can be a great, um, <clears throat> great example of deeper ways that the Gospels go about revealing to us who Jesus is. There are straightforward ways, like John chapter 1 and verse 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then, it, you know, we, as we keep reading, we read Jesus is the Word. So John just lays it out at the very beginning. Hey, everybody, Jesus is God. But the Gospels don't always hand us things quite so easily. They don't always spoon-feed us. Sometimes they go about things in ways that have some depth and some subtlety, and the more and more we know Scripture, the, the more we can pick up on these things. And Jesus walking on the water, I think, is a great uh, example of that. There's so many riches and there, there's so much depth to the Gospels and the whole New Testament that um, a broader knowledge of the rest of Scripture can help us see. Any other thoughts or reflections before we close up for the night? All right, well, uh, thank you all, and uh, we will be dismissed. Next week, we'll begin our summer series. So, excited about that, looking forward to that. <laughs>